<laughs> it went down here left over my eyes this morning. <laughs> and procurement of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will now come to order. Without objection, the Chair and Ranking Minority Member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. I now yield to the uh, let me just read an opening statement and uh, then I'll yield to you, Congressman Rush. I want to welcome all of you today to the hearing that examines the status of government-wide minority contracting programs and the efforts made to date by federal agencies to comply with requirements for minority-owned business programs. In addition, the subcommittee will hear testimony from Congressman Bobby Rush regarding his legislation, which is H.R. 4343, the Minority Business Development Improvements Act of 2009. Programs to assist minority-owned businesses represent one of the several types of programs in place to promote the growth of small businesses' entrepreneurs. Such programs administered under Section 8A of the Small Business Act provide agencies the authority to set aside contracts for small disadvantaged businesses or SDBs and to make sole source awards to such firms. The federal government offers assistance to small businesses to make sure they get a fair proportion of federal contracts and subcontract dollars. In fiscal year 2009, $29.3 billion, or 6.7% of all federal contracts were awarded to minority-owned businesses, out of a total of $537 billion in goods and services 
purchased by federal agencies. A portion of this funding was allocated as part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ARRA. And as of July 16, 2010, the Federal Procurement Data System reported that about $3.6 billion, or 12.6 percent of the ARRA funds, have been awarded to small disadvantaged businesses. While minority contracting programs have proven rewarding to both contractors and the U.S. government, I am aware that significant obstacles and barriers still confront minority contracts in their attempt to bid for and obtain government contracts. Evidence of ongoing and persistent discrimination against minority contractors has been documented over the years. Structural barriers, including access to financing, bonding, and trade union resistance continue to impede the performance and successful participation of minority contractors. Moreover, recent court decisions such as Rothy have uh, impacted the scope and the purpose of minority contracting programs on a going forward basis. I'm very interested in hearing more specifics from our private sector panelists on how documented instances of discrimination have prevented minority firms from advancing in the marketplace, particularly because I do understand that it's often difficult for minority contractors to speak openly about these issues out of their fear that they will be ostracized. If Congress is to address the shortcomings in our minority contract programs, it must have a comprehensive understanding of the problems at hand in order to develop appropriate legislative remedies. It is my hope that this hearing today will make a significant contribution to the development of a meaningful legislative record <coughs> on this important issue. issue. And I welcome all the witnesses that are here today, and we all look forward to your testimony. Okay, okay and now I will uh, turn the mic over to our ranking minority member, Congressman Bilbrey. Madam Chair, you'll be pleased to hear that I have a written statement for the record and ask for unanimous consent to be included in the record. Without objection. I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, we are honored to have a guest panelist and my good friend, Congressman Bobby L. Rush. And uh, Con uh, Congressman Rush was first elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1992 and is uh, presently in his ninth term serving the people of Illinois' uh, first congressional district. And he's a senior member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, where he chairs the Subcommittee on Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection. Congressman Rush is the sponsor of H.R. 4343, the Minority Development Improvements Act of 2009. The legislation would establish a program providing technical assistance, loan guarantees, and contract assistance to qualify minority businesses. Also, the program would broadly resemble existing Small Business Administration, or SBA, programs for small businesses owned <coughs> and controlled by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals, among others, but it would differ in its eligibility criteria and in the loan guarantees and contract assistance provided. Specific eligibility criteria differences include, first, the size of firms allowed to participate, inclusion of certain groups presumed to be disadvantaged, three, 
higher economic and net worth thresholds for individuals seeking to participate, and four, limited eligibility for group owners to participate. And uh, Congressman Rush, uh, you may proceed with your statement. I want to thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson, uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, your stellar leadership on this committee and in other areas of the, of the House for the American people has not gone unnoticed. You are hearing it from coast to coast as being one of the uh, key and one of the most effective members of this Congress. I want to also um, say good morning to my friend for many years. We were elected together in 1992. He took a vacation, uh, wisely so, and he's returned. Uh, Congressman, Congressman Bill Bray, it's so good to be with you and be before you uh, this morning. I would also extend um, my uh, note of me, you being one of the most effective members of the House of Representatives, but you are from the wrong, from a different party, so I can't give you those, <laughs> those accolades. <laughs> uh, but it's good to see you, my friend. <laughs> To all the members of the subcommittee, I am so delighted to be here. I want to thank you for inviting me to testify before your subcommittee on this important uh, hearing on minority contracting opportunities and challenges for current and future minority-owned businesses. During the first half of 2009, Congress took extraordinary steps to turn the nation's economy around and create jobs that will fuel our economic recovery. Many states have already begun to distribute contracts. However, across the country, minority-owned firms are being shut out of the process because of what I call artificial barriers that I believe that this Congress must simply break down. Also, on the outside of the federal marketplace, minority-owned firms are struggling, desperately trying to stay afloat and find the needed financial and technical assistance to continue their operations. In business, the metaphor of the, quote, level playing field, end of quote, comes to mind. But that metaphor doesn't quite describe the circumstances for minority-owned businesses. Far from being on the playing field, many minority businesses and business owners find themselves standing outside the gadium doors uh, where the playing uh, of the business games in, in America are being conducted. Standing on the outside of the stadium uh, in a crowd, trying to raise their voices over the din and over the noise and over the clamor that's going on uh, of businesses who are indeed inside the stadium and playing in uh, the American game of business. They're s speaking with one voice as loud as they can. They're saying, we're here. Look at us, recognize us, acknowledge us. We're here and we want to participate in the American economy. Madam Chair, that's why I'm here today. Because so many of these business persons uh, in my community, in my district, in yours, in district, in districts like ours, uh, they can't be here. Their voices won't be heard today. So I'm here to speak for them uh, in my uh, own way. The question remains to me and to so many others that I represented, why are these companies continually shut out of a process that these men and women, who are also taxpayers, citizens of this nation, veterans of wars of this nation, why are they also uh, why are they out of the process and how can we help fund and support them? Quite frankly, Madam Chair, I find that this situation is totally unacceptable, and I believe that uh, all of you join me in this. Historically, minority-owned firms have long faced an uphill battle in, in gaining a foothold on the national economic scene. 
In 1997, a study by the Urban Institute identified several obstacles faced by minority-owned businesses. At the top of that list was a lack of access to financial capital, limited access to informal business networks, lesser skilled human capital, and limited access to non-minority markets. I'm here today unequivocally stating that by building up minority firms, we can begin to truly drive the economic recovery that Congress and the Obama administration has been so diligently working towards. I spent some time looking for ways to assist minority-owned firms of all sizes and uh, including all business sectors in their efforts to succeed and prosper in their efforts to create jobs in our nation. Minority business and business owners employ nearly 5 million Americans. I looked at the Minority Business Development Agency uh, in my research and the MBBA. This agency is under the auspices of the Department of Commerce. And it's the only federal agency, the only one, the only federal agency in the last 40 years uh, that was created specifically to help minority-owned firms. This agency was created during the years of Richard Nixon, and it has languished in the Department of Commerce, fighting uh, to keep the state alive, really uh, doing, uh, struggling with this tremendous odds, trying to help minority businesses prosper and gain a foothold in the American economy without, with little to no help from the U.S. Congress, an ignored agency for the most part. Unfortunately, even today, it still currently lacks the resources it truly needs to bring about significant change, particularly in today's tough economic climate. If there ever was a time when this agency, given its mission of 40 years ago, needs to be strengthened, I say the time is now. There's no better time than now. Now is the time. To that end, I introduced my bill, H.R. 4343, the Minority Business Development Improvement Act of 2009. If adopted, this bill will establish the Minority Business Development Program to assist qualified minority businesses by providing technical assistance, loan guarantees, and contracting procurement assistance. The bill authorizes the director of the MBDA to certify any entity as a qualified minority business that satisfies each of the eight criteria outlined in the bill. The bill authorizes $200 million to the director to carry out the technical assistance program and $500 million uh, for loan guarantees. The bill will also allow firms participating in the program to bid on select set-aside contracts for goods and services. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters of this committee, I believe that it's time to bring the Minority Business Development Agency to the forefront of our nation's economic recovery. And I'm sure that other witnesses at today's hearing will concur with me. I'm also sure that each one of you have felt in your own way the desire to turn things around and to regain our economic footing for the people in our local communities and throughout the nation. Madam Chair, I urge members of this subcommittee to join me uh, in an effort to create a viable platform for minority-owned business development. Again, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to address uh, this uh, auspicious and, and, and this very important committee of the U.S. House of Representatives and I thank you, and I am available for questions that you might have. We want to thank you, too, for bringing this issue 
being persistent on this issue mm -hmm. over a period of time to our attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is right for us to have a hearing and bring all the facts as we know them uh, to the table so that we can start discussing how we can do remedies, as mm -hmm. I said before. Mm -hmm. Uh, based on the information from your constituents, and uh, I know that you have a history of always being tuned in mm. to the people in your constituency and even out of your constituency, mm. or whatever sources uh, you might have been uh, talking with, how has the recent recession affected the minority-owned firms seeking to obtain government financing or federal contracts? M Madam Chair, uh, thank you for the great question. And as I have ex expressed before, there are still great disparities. Uh, do, you, do you have kind of a percentage? Let's just take within your district. What would you say uh, the percentages would be in terms of those receiving contracts? Well, it's, it's very paltry. I say that uh, the, uh, during this era, the Recovery Act, less than 3% of the minority-owned businesses uh, in my district have been affected. Mm -hmm. Although we took initial steps, we had a number of seminars and forums. We brought government officials out early on when this was first proposed. We try to get ahead of the tide, uh, ahead of the program. We wanted to be the firstest with the mostest. However, as we see how uh, this program, these programs and these dollars are being spent, they have very little effect on my district. And one of the reasons why they have very little effect on my district is that there is not a singular entity uh, or uh, that really can help uh, address and deal with some of the difficulties that minority businesses have historically affected. Uh, and that's why I, I focus on uh, the, again, the Nixon, President Nixon created program, the Minority Business Development uh, Agency, and look at that and say, well, this is what's sorely needed in this time. If we're going to increase from 3% to 10%, to 25%, to 30%, then we've got to have advocate, an advocate, a well-armed, well-financed, well-intentioned, focused advocate, advocate uh, that will uh, uh, help the minority uh, this, uh, uh, businesses in my district and provide assistance. Madam Chair, uh, I'm, I'm astounded. And I'm sh uh, ashamed to say this, but the MBDA right now is the smallest federal agency within the federal government. It has been flatlined in terms of its budget for over 40 years, flatlined. Everything else is taken off, is soaring, but the one agency that can make a significant difference in my community, other minority communities, the one agency whose mission it is to help uh, engage my constituents, your constituents, in a robust manner in this Congress, that agency is more bond almost because of the lack of funding and resources that it has. Let me just say this. Uh, we're all in this Congress focusing on jobs, jobs, jobs. Yes. And when we cannot focus or train uh, our awards to these companies, there's a great number of people without jobs laid off. Mm. That is correct. Uh, what is the jobless rate? percentage-wise, in your constituency? Well, Madam Chair, uh, thank you for that question. And let me just say, the published rates are about 16%. That's the published rates. Now, the real rates are, are more like about 30 35%. 
And that's just the ones who are considered unemployed and the ones who are, might be uh, eligible for unemployed, uh, unemployed uh, uh, in benefits, unemployed benefits. Those who have dropped out of the job market, I mean, totally dropped out, then you would look at, you would probably say it's somewhere, somewhere around about 45%, mm -hmm. all right? If you want to include young people in it, then it's almost 50%, all right? So, I mean, you talk about a depression. I'm not sure whether, what the economists, uh, how they identify the parameters of a depression, but I would just say that most of my district is beneath whatever the it's parameter. It's a depressed area, is it's, what you're it's, saying. It's, it's, yes, it's, much, much, it's almost like a third world country in my district. In listening very closely to what you see as a remedy, I think it goes to the basis that the agency that uh, was established to see that we had eligibility requirements that could be met by minority businesses is underfunded. Absolutely, it's underfunded. I underfunded, uh, 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 is, that's, the, that's the foundation for the problem, is that it's underfunded. So it really becomes a fiscal problem for us mm -hmm. uh, to see that we share with this agency uh, a justifiable amount so that we can increase minority contracts and put people back to work. Yeah, is, Madam Chair. Is, is that a statement you're trying uh, that would be verified by your bill? Yeah, it would be. Okay. It would be. And, and, and if you just want to look at, take, if we just extrapolate just for uh, a quick moment, if we invest in the beginning, at the outset, if we invest in minority businesses, invest in this agency, in this agency then the savings to the American taxpayer on the other end would be a hundred times or greater. Because if you invest in creating businesses, creating jobs, then your investment in the social programs and the prisons and the uh, inadequate schools, that investment on the back end would be less if you invest in a robust biz minority business program in the initial uh, in stages in order to help create jobs. I mean, jobs are still the definition. Jobs are still the, uh, the standard for being productive in this society. And to, uh, jobs are still the creator of the American dream and of the American economy. And so by helping to, the real stimulus program that I think we need now is to stimulate minority businesses so that minority businesses can do its right, rightful and natural function of creating jobs for the American people. Thank you. And I'll now yield to Mr. Bill Burry. Congressman, thank you for your kind words. <clears throat> Let me just say, as somebody who was born and raised in a working class neighborhood, one of the things that frustrate me so often is, first of all, a lot of people come into our communities that are distressed and see the unemployment, see the, the redlining. I still remember this one company, this one bank that I caught um, when I was mayor of a small town and said uh, uh, that the 7-Eleven being built in my community would get half the revenue and be twice as expensive as the same 7-Eleven being built in another community. Now, I can understand half the revenue or reduce revenue because of our economic situation, but twice as expensive? So, you know, that tricky little game you get into. So I've seen that, but I concern that we approach our, the many times what we think is the problem is a symptom of deeper problems, and we see things in isolation. We go in and say, this unemployment is the problem, when in reality, there's a bigger problem. One thing that I really want us to concentrate on is that the minority community does not operate um, in the business community in isolation. It's part of a broader network. But wouldn't you agree that if you were breaking down the businesses in the three categories, large, medium, and small, that there's very few minority and, um, 
owned businesses in the large category. Big business right. tends to be exclusive. Mm -hmm. Medium, you have some, but not much. But the overwhelming majority of minority and disadvantage is in the small category. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to understand that a lot of these barriers um, appear to be just race-based or social economic. But in reality, because of the way systems, especially in the government, is operated, we favor the big guy so much that indirectly there's a discrimination that not only is based on the color of your skin, but more importantly by the volume of your, your pocketbook. Mm -hmm. And it happens that the minority and disadvantaged community tends to fall into that category along with other groups. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at the fact that one of the biggest problems we have with this program is we tend to put the, the weight on that middle ground, that if you want to qualify, you must qualify to be one of those medium-sized businesses, the initial hit. But if you're one of the smaller guys, you're not big enough to compete for those contracts. You're not able to fulfill those requirements. And the system tends to say, we don't care, medium guy, if all of your subcontractors are disadvantaged. We want you to be disadvantaged. And so you don't have the incubator process. I mean, let's face it, the great majority of these non-minority um, businesses did not, were not born big, mm -hmm. were not born even medium. They grew from the small, but the incubator concept tends to be stifled right now when I look at federal contracting. In fact, one of the biggest problems we have, I think, with the fraud in this system is that a lot of middle and big business are creating the fraud to get this advantage where the true disadvantaged business uh, people are not gaining access because they're too small to compete in the existing federal program. They're not big enough to be able to play the game and thus they de facto get cut out, not because of who they are, but because of the size they are. But the result is the same, exactly the same. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Milgray. Let me just say this. It seems to me that the, the, the problem that you're addressing, first of all, let me, small business employer, uh, the, uh, the majority of the American people, firms across, this is across the board, firms that employ less than 500 people are the main employers of the American people, not major corporations, it's, it's the small, small businesses. And what I think, I, I do think that there is a fallacy and there is a fault line within, especially in terms of the federal government, because they do favor large corporations. And I think that, that, that certainly addresses why there's such a need for the MBDA, because we have got to change the uh, thinking pattern, the mindset of the federal uh, procurement community so that they will go out of their way rather than discriminating against small businesses, that they will have, uh, uh, they will switch the paradigm uh, and, and, and start thinking in terms of that small business should be a premium, should be the, the priority for federal procurement. Now, it might be cumbersome in one is, is, to one extent, maybe in terms of the, the uh, bureaucracy or the paperwork, or the, but in this age of computerization and uh, technological innovation, I think that we, you know, the, we're living in a new world. And I don't think the same impediments that existed 10, 20 years ago exist now in terms of how do you manage having more contracts uh, 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 broken down, you know, smaller contracts, you know, and then thereby by inviting more and more businesses. Let, let, me, let me kind of reinforce. So one of the problems we have now is if you have that middle business size put a bid in, they do not get credit for the fact that all of their subcontractors or a large percentage of their subcontractors may be disadvantaged businesses. When So what happens is there's not the incentive to help incubate and grow the small into the medium to where you have, an evil, you have the ability to compete in there. It's like we look at whoever's the bidder and we don't look at where their supply chain is. And you and I know from the employment point of view, just from the workers in your district, 
if they're hired by a subcontractor who's doing the government project, that is just as good a job as if they're hired by the, co the guy who got the contract originally. But we're not right now giving any credit for those middlemen or the, the guys who are getting the bid of literally incorporating the small guy, the small guy into it um, and, and making a special effort to go out and get those disadvantaged businesses into their proposal. And I, I really think that there's a real missing link to build this foundation. This kind of economic prosperity doesn't happen overnight. It's, a, it's, a, it's not just a political and a, a government thing, it's a cultural thing of people getting in the habit of giving people a chance to bid and compete in there and rewarding them for taking the effort to go do that. Right now, I run into situations of frustration where a lot of guys are telling me I can't, I don't even get credit if I go out and recruit this on a lot of these contracts. And I, I think that's one of the things we gotta be frank and open about just because it appears that we're playing a game by setting it aside the outcome doesn't reflect reality, and the outcome proves to us what we've been doing traditionally is not, not doing it right. And I think we should be willing to shake it up a little bit and try these new things of saying, you got a contractor who has done that outreach into the minority community and got subcontractors, he should get credit and, get, and, and be reflected in a benefit to him for going out and recruiting and, getting, and in, incorporating and integrating those, those subcontractors into, into the process and empowering the the disadvantaged businesses to start growing. And I think, guess that's a critical component. And I know that sounds like an abstract, but if you're gonna create the jobs, you gotta make, you gotta change the system. Well, my only response to you, uh, Mr. Bill Gray, is that let's shake, rattle, and roll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce one of our colleagues, Judy Chu, California, uh, for sitting in with us this morning and uh, you probably didn't hear the opening statement, but I know that you understand the subject matter. Would you like to make a comment? I'm just uh, happy to be here to pursue the issue of uh, improving our minority contracting uh, opportunities, and uh, I'm glad to hear the testimony, and um, I, I certainly uh, support uh, Congressmember Rush's uh, efforts in doing so. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, and thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Bobby Rush, yeah. for being consistent and staying on us until we had this hearing. We appreciate it so much. Thank you very uh, much. Man. This will conclude the testimony for Congressman Rush, and uh, thank you again. Thank you and, so much. And uh, I would like uh, to invite our second panel, but before you come up, uh, will staff bring the chairs back? And uh, we will call up the second panel that is composed of David Henson, the Honorable uh, Marie C. Johns, uh, Mr. J. Young Park, Linda Oliver, and Brandon Neal. Be sure we have Right. It's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before you testify, and I'd like to ask you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Say aye. 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 With that, you may be seated and let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. 
I will now introduce each one of you. Uh, Mr. David Henson is the Director of the Minority Business Development Agency at the Department of Commerce. Mr. Henson oversees five regional offices and a network of 48 minority business centers that provide services to promote the growth and competitiveness of minority businesses. Prior to this position, Mr. Henson was President and CEO of the Wealth Management Network Incorporated, a multi-million dollar independent financial advisory boutique. He also managed a 10-state sales region as Director of Advisory Services for Investnet Asset Management, a $70 billion financial advisory firm. Ms. Marie Johns serves as the Deputy Administrator of the Small Business Administration. Prior to her appointment, Ms. Johns was a managing member of l l Consulting, LLC, and she's also past president of Verizon in Washington, D.C. At Verizon, Ms. Johns was responsible for 2,000 employees and over 800 customers, including many of the small businesses. Mr. Ji Young Park serves as Ms. Excuse me, Ji Young Park serves as the Associate Administer Administrator for Small Business Utilization at the General Services Administration, where she oversees the agency's small business policies and programs. Previously, Ms. Park worked at the Touchstone Consulting, where she managed uh, communications strategy and program management efforts for the U.S. Agency for International Development and National Science Foundation and the Small Business Administration. Ms. Linda Oliver is the Acting Director of the Office of Small Business Programs at the Department of Defense, where she implements DOD policies that encourage the department to provide opportunities for small businesses to successfully compete for small business contracts. And finally, Mr. Brandon Neal is the Director of the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization at the Department of Transportation, where he advises the Secretary of Transportation on opportunities for small and disadvantaged businesses to participate in the department's contracting process. Prior to this position, Mr. Neal worked uh, as a financial director for African American Affairs with Obama for America, and he also worked for the Democratic Governors Association as deputy political director and later as director of extended affairs. I ask that each one of the witnesses at the panel now give a brief summary of their testimony and uh, to keep this summary under five minutes in duration, and I know you can do that, <laughs> because your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. So I'd like to start with Mr. Henson. Uh, please proceed. Chairwoman Watson, member Bilbray, and members of the subcommittee, Thank you for inviting the Minority Business Development Agency to appear before this subcommittee. I request that my entire written statement, including attachments, be entered into the official hearing record. For over 40 years, MBDA has been working aggressively to expand the economic footprint of minority business enterprises, or MBEs. At the time of the agency's creation in 1969, there were approximately 322 thousand NBEs that generated $10.6 billion in annual gross receipts. Today, according to the recent release numbers by the U.S. Census Bureau, the number of NBEs stands at 5.8 million, generating $1 trillion in gross receipts. However, while the recent numbers are encouraging, there is still work left to be done. Discriminatory barriers continue to persist which impede the ability of MBEs to access the federal marketplace on an equal footing with non-minority owned and operated businesses. I am submitting for the record as attachment A, 
To my testimony, a document entitled The Compelling Interest for Race and Gender Conscious Federal Contracting Programs, which details these barriers as well as a number of disparity studies. MBDA is working to eliminate these barriers, acting as both an advocate and facilitator for minority-owned firms seeking to gain greater access to the marketplace, including but not limited to procurement opportunities with the federal government. A great deal of work takes place in MBDA business centers located across the country and in Puerto Rico. The centers provide technical assistance to improve MBE competitiveness at securing both public and private contracts in addition to promoting joint ventures and teaming arrangements as we recognize some contracts are too large for one firm to, compete, to complete for a loan. In FY 2009, MBDA helped generate $2.2 billion um, in contracts and helped create 3,858 new jobs. This exceeds the agency's FY 2009 goals of $900 million in contracts and 3,000 new jobs. We expect to surpass our 2009 performance in fiscal year 2010. MBDA also works to match MBEs with contracting opportunities that fit each firm's profile and capabilities. Two of the more prominent methods of our, are our business-to-business -business linkage form and the Phoenix Opportunity Database. MBDA hosts B2Bs throughout the year, matching MBEs with the public and private contracts ready to be let. During the B2B, MBEs have an opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with interested contract officers from all levels of the government and the private sector to examine the possibility of doing business together. For example, at this year's National Minority Enterprise Development Week conference, MBDA presented more than $30 billion in public and private sector forecasted contract opportunities. The Phoenix Opportunity Database, which is linked to FedBizOps, helps to connect MBEs with available contracting opportunities. Using the system, MBEs input their profiles in the system accessible on the MBDA website. Contracting officers throughout the federal, state, and local government can use the system to upload notices of their federal contracts into the MBDA Opportunity Database. The system then matches each opportunity with MBEs meeting the requirements of the solicitation. The lack of access to capital has often inhibited the ability of MBEs to compete for federal contracts. In January of 2010, MBDA released a report titled Disparities in Capital Access Between Minority and Non-Minority Owned Businesses, The Troubling Reality of Capital Limitations Faced by MBEs. This report, which examines the issue of capital access, accompanies my testimony as attachment B. Capital, in the form of surety bonds, is required for federal construction contracts. However, as credit markets tighten, obtaining bonding has become even more difficult. MBDA is working on a surety bonding initiative to alleviate this problem and help MBE secure the bonding needed to meet the requirements of federal contracts. On April 26th of this year, President Obama established an interagency task force on federal contracting opportunities for small businesses of which MBDA was a member. The task force was charged with providing recommendations to the president to help ensure that small businesses, including minority-owned businesses, have fair access to federal contracting dollars. These recommendations include addressing the issue of contract bundling, contract subcontract planning, and identifying ways to increase small business utilization in prime contracting. MBDA was honored to serve on this task force and work with our colleagues to implement the recommendations put forth. So in conclusion, MBDA will continue to take an active role in eliminating barriers faced by MBEs in our federal marketplace. MBDA is creating a government contracting unit under our Office of Business Development. This unit will be comprised of experts focusing on assisting minority-owned firms in, exact, in uh, accessing contracting opportunities. We anticipate having this unit operational in the near future. Also, the agency is working closely with Secretary Locke in establishing a National Advisory Council on Minority Business Enterprise 
to advise the administration on issues pertaining to the growth of minority-owned firms, including access to federal contracts. MBEs are a critical part of this country's economic infrastructure, and it is in federal contracting that many will find avenues for growth. MBDA looks forward to working with Congress to help create more entry points into the federal marketplace for MBEs. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Henson and Ms. Johns. You may proceed. Thank you, Chairwoman Watson. Welcome. Ranking Member Bill Bray, members of the subcommittee, I'm honored to testify on this very important topic. And I'm honored to be in my role for a little over two and a half months now as the deputy administrator at the Small Business Administration. Minority business is something that I care deeply about, and it goes back.